This is carboniferous limestone. This is what happens when dilute hydrochloric acid is poured onto it. A reaction takes place and the rock begins to break down. Rainwater is acidic. It picks up carbon dioxide from the atmosphere to form weak carbonic acid, which also reacts with limestone. Calcium carbonate is converted into calcium hydrogen carbonate, which dissolves. And this is the landscape formed when a bare carboniferous limestone surface is exposed to rainwater for long periods of time. This landscape, it's the Burren in Western Ireland, has been produced by a single process, solution. We're going to look at the features produced by solution and at the rate at which such a landscape may have evolved. We can do this because we know when this surface was exposed to the weather for the first time. It was about 10,000 years ago when the ice sheets finally retreated from this area. However, there's a problem. We can't be sure that solution rates are uniform across this entire region. In fact, they obviously are not. We can see this here on the seashore. Above the high water mark, typical limestone surfaces. Note the joints. But below, in the splash zone, a very different picture. Here, solution has been so great that the entire surface has disintegrated, and the joint pattern which controlled solution above the high water mark can no longer be traced. Accelerated rates of solution on this scale obviously imply high levels of acidity. These are not to be found in seawater, which is almost completely neutral. But the many living things which are found in this intertidal zone almost invariably secrete acids. Small creatures like these sea urchins secrete so much acid that they dissolve the limestone around them and form these distinct cylindrical depressions in which they live. Inland, the features produced by solution are less grotesque but no less impressive. This, for example, is classic limestone pavement. The underlying strata is horizontal. Limestone doesn't bend easily. It tends to crack under stress. Its surface is almost level and swept clear of soil and vegetation by the retreating ice. It's the cracking which produces a complex pattern of joints. Solution attacks these joints, widening them to form grikes. The blocks in between are called clints. Together, they form one of the most distinctive landscapes in the world. A landscape formed within the last 10,000 years. This is a glacial erratic, a boulder dropped by the retreating ice sheet. There are many of them on the Burren, each standing on a small mound or pedestal. 10,000 years ago, such boulders rested on the limestone surface, a surface exposed to solution except where protected by the erratic. Today, the general surface is much lower, but the erratic remains at the original level and is left perched on a small pedestal. By measuring the height of a single pedestal, in this case, it's very clear, it is possible to gain an impression of the lowering of the limestone surface in a small area. By measuring many pedestals and by taking the mean of these measurements, a more accurate impression can be gained of surface lowering throughout the region. First, however, it's necessary to measure a section across each pedestal. To do this, a survey line is set up through the erratic. This is accurately surveyed using a level so that the height of the pedestal can be established relative to the general limestone surface. A survey of pedestals in different parts of the burren suggests an average annual rate of lowering of 0.0152 millimetres per year. 15.2 centimetres in 10,000 years. But it also suggests that rates vary, particularly between bare pavement and those areas where the limestone is covered by turf. We've seen limestone pavement. Notice the smooth surface of the clints. Now look at the limestone surface under turf. The differences may not be striking, but the surface does appear to be more uneven, and this suggests a higher rate of solution. These impressions can be tested by making a detailed survey in an area where turf and pavement occur side by side. Once again, a line of survey is established. 
Levels are taken at four meter intervals along this line. Notice that the surveying pole is driven down to the rock surface beneath any turf. The findings of such a survey are surprising. Solution is most rapid where the limestone is apparently protected by the turf. And rock surfaces here are generally lower than on the bare pavement. However, a more detailed picture of solution on these contrasting surfaces is needed. This can be obtained by carrying out a quadrant survey. First, quadrant locations are established using random numbers. The first number is chosen, and this determines the distance in paces along the survey line. Paces can be used since random rather than exact locations are needed. The quadrant is dropped. A metal probe is used to determine the depth of the rock surface beneath the quadrant. Measurements are taken at selected intersects. A regular pattern of points is generally used, and a detailed record is kept of surface type and rock depth. Histograms can be drawn. This is the histogram showing readings taken on bare limestone surfaces. There are two peaks. Here, marking the uneroded upper surface, and here, representing the bottom of the solution hollows in that surface. The difference between them is eight centimeters. This is the average depth of solution. This is the histogram for turf-covered surfaces. The hollows in the surface are obviously deeper. The average depth of solution is about 10 centimeters, and the surface is more irregular. Once again, this suggests higher levels of acidity under the turf. We can test for this. First, we collect rainwater, which has percolated through the turf. Here we are using plastic guttering, but any kind of ducting can be used. To measure pH, a universal indicator strip is used. The broad band in the center of the strip is the test area. When immersed in the sample, this changes color. Comparison can be made with the standard colors above or below. In this case, a reading of 5.9 is obtained. As a basis for comparison, we collect rainwater before it reaches the surface. For this, we're using a simple homemade rain gauge. The pH of this sample is very different. About 6.3, still acidic, but less so than the soil water. The increased acidity of the water at the base of the turf is again the result of the secretion of organic acids within this thin layer of turf. And organic acids, most of them secreted by plants and soil animals living in the sheltered environment provided by the joints, have contributed to the concentration of solution here. This has produced the most distinctive feature of limestone surfaces, grikes. And once again, solution is greatest where there is turf, and here the grikes can become very wide and deep. and the importance of soil and the organic acids produced by animal activity and the decay of vegetation within the soil is clearly seen in the development of this grike. The contrast between solution features on bare and turf-covered limestone can take a more extreme form. This is typical pavement, a vast expanse of clints and grikes. These are shake holes, hollows produced by concentrated solution taking place under turf. Variations in rates of solution of this kind make any overall assessment of landscape formation difficult. 
For this, it's necessary to look at the results of solution over a large area, an area in which many different rates of solution may operate. An area like this catchment. Let's look at it in more detail. The central area is limestone, part turf covered, part bare. To the east and west, the limestone is covered by a shale cap. Streams rise on the impermeable shale and flow on the surface. On reaching the limestone, they disappear underground down swallow holes. Then the streams flow underground, collecting rainwater from the entire limestone area as it percolates into the system of joints within the catchment. As a result, concentrations of calcium ions build up in the streams. If we sample the water in a stream here on the shale cap before it disappears underground, and again here, where the entire river system emerges, the difference between the two samples can give the total amount of calcium carbonate which has been removed in the limestone area. This is a stream flowing on the shale cap, and there's the swallow hole down which it disappears, just to the right of the road. This swallow hole isn't spectacular. It's marked by nothing more than a slight enlargement of the joint system in the bed of the stream when it reaches the limestone. However, a few hundred meters down the slope on the limestone surface proper, there's another sinkhole, and this time it's much more impressive. This is, in fact, a pothole, a former swallow hole long since abandoned by the river which formed it. And the reason for its abandonment is comparatively simple. The stream flows on the impermeable shale cap, disappearing down a swallow hole when it reaches the limestone. At the same time, it cuts back the cap and eventually finds a new route underground, leaving the former swallow hole as a fossilized pothole. The stream which flows down the swallow hole and eventually down to the pothole has flowed only on the shale cap. It should therefore contain little or no dissolved calcium. We can test for this using a cheap and readily available field kit. First, a sample is taken from the stream which is flowing on the shale. Notice that the bottle is thoroughly rinsed before this is done. An indicator is added to the sample. This explains its pink color. A reagent is then carefully added, drop by drop. There's a color change after a certain number of drops. Here, only one drop is needed, confirming that there's virtually no dissolved calcium in the stream. This is the dry bed of the river system, five kilometers to the south. And this is the rising, the point where the river reappears on the surface. For a comparison of dissolved calcium levels to be made, a sample must again be taken. The same field test is used. This time, concentrations are obviously much higher. In fact, nine drops of reagent are needed to cause a color change, indicating concentrations of more than 150 parts per million. Remember, there was little or no dissolved calcium in this stream on the shale cap. But we need to know the amount of dissolved calcium removed by our river system. This means that it's also necessary to calculate the volume of water passing through the rising over a known period of time. We survey a cross-section of the channel. We use a level to obtain an accurate profile. At the same time, the depth of water is noted at regular intervals across the bed. 
Next, a flow meter is used to measure the velocity of the stream. Once again, readings are taken at regular intervals. From these, a mean reading can be obtained. Multiply the cross-sectional area by the mean current velocity, and you've calculated stream discharge. Measurements are repeated many times, over as long a period of time as possible, and a mean discharge figure is obtained for this period. From this, you can obtain annual discharge. We know the concentration of calcium ions in the river. We know the annual discharge of the river. From this, we can calculate the weight of calcium carbonate removed. And using the density, this figure can easily be converted into the volume of calcium carbonate removed. The method is given in the booklet which accompanies this series. Divide this figure by the known area of the catchment, and you have a measure of the annual rate of lowering over the entire limestone surface. For this catchment, it is 0.022 millimetres per year, 22 centimetres in 10,000 years. This figure is considerably higher than that obtained from the pedestal survey. Remember there, it was 15 centimetres in 10,000 years. How do we account for the difference? One explanation is obvious. Solution continues when a river disappears underground and joints and bedding planes are enlarged to form cave systems. In these caves, the water percolating through the roof contains so much dissolved calcium that deposition may take place. These stalactites and stalagmites were formed in this way. The water dripping from the roof of the cave eventually finds its way into the river, increasing the concentrations of calcium ions there. Cave systems are well developed on the Baron, and underground solution undoubtedly accounts for a large proportion of the difference between our two measurements. And to close, one final question. Whatever the rate of solution, whether it's at the level suggested by the pedestal survey or at the higher levels indicated by the catchment study, could that rate explain the landforms on the Burren? And could those landforms have developed since the ice retreated? Some obviously could. This limestone pavement, for example, with its clints and grikes, and smaller surface features like these caverns and runnels. Large-scale joint widening like this. even a pavement like this, which has virtually disintegrated into a chaotic jumble of rocks with little trace of the joint pattern which controlled its development. This could have been formed since the last ice age. Swallow holes like this are obviously still in the process of formation and are of comparatively recent date. But have potholes like this been formed and abandoned since the ice retreated? And could current rates of solution account for the formation of closed depressions of this size within the space of 10,000 years? Or of dry valleys on a scale like this? The answer is probably no, and that here we are dealing with landforms created before the area was covered by ice.